In the race for the riches of the new world, Spain and Portugal lead the rest. Led by the great discoverers, Columbus, Magellan, Vasco da Gama, De Soto, these nations early stake out their claim to colonies. Hernan Cortez conquers Mexico and sends back galleons freighted with looted gold and Aztec treasure. But some of these ships never reach home. They are captured by English pirates who marvel at the gold and pieces of eight. And when Spain assembles the greatest fleet ever built, the rivalry with England intensifies. It reaches its climax in a great naval battle in which the English smash, sink, and put to rout the Spanish Armada. Now it will be England's turn. One of her great explorers, Sir Walter Raleigh, dreams of colonies in the New World, named in honor of Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. But Elizabeth will be dead. It will take another 20 years, failure after heartbreaking failure, before the English seed finally takes root. By the end of the 16th century, for the ordinary farmer, life in England has grown more and more harsh. To get the wool needed for her increasing overseas trade, England needs more sheep. To get the grazing land needed for the huge new flocks, the Enclosure Acts are passed. Parliament authorizes the fencing off of the common land farmers have been allowed to till since medieval times. Farmers are now driven off land they have enjoyed for generations. And as land becomes more and more scarce, rents multiply. Riots break out. In England, the cry is heard, Sheep eat men. Losing their lands, farmers drift to the city, swelling the crowds of the urban poor. More and more are thrown into debtor's prison. crowded cities, in the jam-packed slums, there are increasing outbreaks of plague. Men begin to say that England is overcrowded. If only there were some place Englishmen could have a chance for a new life. But if the poor feel only a growing hopelessness and despair, the rich see new opportunity. Merchant capitalists organized to form stock companies to exploit the wealth of America. If English colonies can be founded across the ocean, they can supply the raw materials needed at home and at the same time consume England's surplus of manufactures. If only they can get men to go. Hear ye, hear ye. Advertisement for the London Company. An expedition to the new lands of Virginia. Pleasant land, rich new soil, and gold. Gold, the things a man can do with gold. They are ready to go anywhere. Spring. 1607, in Jamestown, Virginia, three tiny ships drop anchor in the James River. 104 men, no women, have survived a wintry crossing that has lasted five months. The Susan Constant is only 80 feet long. The Godspeed is only half that size. The Discovery is a pinnace, barely 20 feet long, an overgrown rowboat. There were no sanitary conditions aboard. 
Men, goats, pigs, chickens, horses have shared the same quarters. For want of air, many men slept on deck during the long winter crossing. Now, having landed safely and begun to build shelter, the colonists are afraid. There are 104 white men on a vast and alien continent. On all sides, they are surrounded by Indians. One sensible man, Captain John Smith, urges that they take stronger measures to protect themselves. But the others, believing that they have landed in the fabled El Dorado, are too busy digging the worthless sand that they believe to be gold. They send back the first ship loaded with this dirt. Smith is disgusted with them. There is no talk, no hope, no work. But dig gold, wash gold, refine gold. The son of an English farmer, at 27, John Smith has been a soldier in Europe and in Asia. To some, he is a braggart and a troublemaker. But a few skirmishes with the Indians, a few arrows winging out of the forest, and they turn to Smith to protect them. And because he has a healthy regard for his own skin, he saves theirs. He strengthens the fort and redesigns the palisades. He forces them to drill and whips them into a fighting force. He issues an order. Those that do not work shall not eat. He ventures forth and establishes trade with the Indians. He creates one of our oldest and most enduring legends of having his life saved by the Indian princess, Pocahontas. John Smith, soldier of fortune, who came to Virginia a prisoner in chains, charged with mutiny, becomes the acknowledged leader of Jamestown. But in 1609, Smith suffers serious burns and is forced to return to England. Without him, Jamestown begins to fall apart. In settling the colony, the settlers have obeyed the strict letter of their instructions from the London Company. They had been ordered to settle far enough up the James River to be safe from the Spanish guns. In obeying the strict letter of their instructions, they have settled on one of the most unhealthy spots possible. Fifty or a hundred miles further, the story might have been different. But from the low marshy ground rise strange fevers. New arrivals have strengthened the colony to 500. From London, these newcomers also bring the plague. Winter, 1609. The starving time begins. George Percy writes in his diary. Then, having fed upon horses and other beasts as long as they lasted, we ate boots and any other leather, searched the woods to feed upon serpents and snakes, and the famine was ghastly. Nine out of every ten die. Death. The equalizer levels gentlemen and commoner. From 500, the population goes down to 60. They're about to give up. They're already aboard the ship to sail home. When they are met at the mouth of the James River by newly arrived ships bringing supplies and reinforcements. They turn back to start again. In London, John Smith reads Percy's diary and is disgusted that in a land teeming with game, the settlers at Jamestown had managed to starve to death. Nevertheless, Smith writes enthusiastic books about the colonies and the colonists and he tries to persuade the London Company to change its attitude toward the colony. 
He tells them to forget about quick riches, to send to the colonies practical men who can build for the future. Better 30 carpenters, farmers, fishermen, blacksmiths, masons than a thousand such as we now have. Admitting their failures, taking a more realistic attitude, the Jamestown colonists slowly begin to change. In 1612, John Rolfe finds a way to cure and sweeten the harsh Indian tobacco and establishes the colony's first cash crop. As Jamestown begins to grow more prosperous, it begins to attract more people. They begin to spread out and begin to form more and more communities. By 1620, the Virginia colonies number almost 2,000 people. A year earlier, a cargo of 20 Negroes had been landed. But these first Negroes come as indentured servants. Slavery will not begin until later. That year, another ship lands. Wives for the settlers of Jamestown. Men stop thinking of quick riches and returning to England. Married men plan to raise families and stay. In Virginia, in the first southern colonies, the colonists take firm roots. If men have gone to Virginia in search of gold, now they go to New England to worship God in their own way. December 1620, the pilgrims step ashore on Plymouth Rock, 50 men, 20 women, 32 children, who have survived an incredible journey. The sea was so high and the wind so fierce, we could not bear an inch of sail, but were forced to lay to and drift for days on end. For 64 days, we ate only hard tack, cheese, salt horse, and dried fish. Three babies were born on the ship, one stillborn. Brought safe to land, we fell upon our knees and blessed the God of heaven who had delivered us and again set our feet on stable earth, our proper element. Before us was the wilderness, behind us the mighty ocean. What could sustain us now but God? The heart of winter came upon us, yet we went ashore to fell timber, some to saw, some to rivet, some to carry. No man rested. We went to work and built a platform for our ordnance. It was so cold that the water froze upon our clothes and made them like coats of iron. What manner of men were they? These men who had entered into a compact aboard the Mayflower, signing a promise to obey the rules of the colony they were about to form. The Pilgrim Fathers were young men, William Bradford was only 31 when he became governor of the colony. A self-educated weaver, he left 275 journals and letters to England. In his journals is the account of the first terrible winter. Many of us fell sick. In two or three months' time, half our people starved, and we buried them in a common grave. There, under the cover of darkness, the vast dwindling company laid their dead, leveling the earth above them, lest the Indians should learn how many were the graves. What manner of men were they? A hundred and two landed. That first winter, 51 died, exactly half. But when the crew of the Mayflower prepared to sail the ship back to England in the spring, how many of the settlers were ready to quit? How many pilgrims went back. Not one, not a single one. These pilgrims had come and they were determined to stay. They had put their faith in their God and he smiled upon them. In the spring, an Indian appeared and he spoke English. He had been captured by English fishermen 
and had sailed with them up the coast of Newfoundland. He went away and returned with another Indian, Squanto, who also spoke English, and who told them he had been captured, brought to England, and then returned to his native land by an English captain. And this Squanto was of great help to us. Squanto coached them in their dealings with the Indians. He showed them how to clear the land and plant the Indian corn, where to fish, and how to trap deer. And as they survived and were reinforced, they grew sturdier and more confident. Now they were able to advise others who sought advice about coming to the colonies. Dear sir, you ask how the drinking water is in the colonies. It may not be as wholesome as the wine and liquor in London, but it is wholesome enough for us. Dear madam, you ask if the colonies are full of mosquitoes? Those too delicate to endure the bite of a mosquito were best to stay at home till at least they were mosquito-proof. To the colonists, mosquitoes were the least of their danger. The success of the pilgrims, their ability to endure and to create a new life in the wilderness begins to encourage other dissenters. In 1630, the Puritans arrive in force. Eleven ships, 900 people, enough to settle eight towns in Massachusetts. Their leader, John Winthrop, prays for the success of the new colony. The God of Israel is among us, and he shall make us a praise and the glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. richer than the pilgrims, better businessmen, better organized, bringing with them flocks of cattle, the Puritans are more quickly prosperous. They start school, establish the first college in the colonies, Harvard. They are called Puritans because they want to purify the Church of England, scrap the prayer book in favor of the Bible, simplify the ritual and observe the Sabbath strictly. But although they have suffered persecution in England, the Puritans are quick to use the same tactics against others. A proud, stiff-necked people, they can accept no criticism of their doctrine. A young minister, Roger Williams, finds himself more and more rebelling against the harsh Puritan ideas. Williams denies that the Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay Colony have the right to take Indian lands without paying for them. He preaches freedom of conscience. He says, False worship stinks in God's nostrils. Learning he is about to be imprisoned, the young minister flees into the wilderness and is befriended by the Indians. He makes his way to Rhode Island, where he founds a different kind of colony. In Rhode Island, Roger Williams establishes the principle of religious freedom. The Puritans are quick to make enemies. Other dissenters leave or are driven from Massachusetts. When Anne Hutchinson and her family are banished, her followers form new communities in Portsmouth and Newport. The Reverend Thomas Hooker leads another group to found new communities in Connecticut. Connecticut has the first written constitution. The stiff, unyielding attitude of the Puritans in Massachusetts leads to an interesting variety of colonies in New England. Meanwhile, the Dutch have settled in New York. There are Swedes in Delaware and New Jersey. Jews begin to come and live among the Dutch. Welcomed in Rhode Island, they start their first synagogue in Newport. As religious and civil wars sweep England and Europe, more and more men come to America to worship God in their own way. In 1632, Lord Baltimore establishes Maryland as a haven for Catholics. In 1682, 
William Penn establishes Pennsylvania as a place where Quakers welcome all who worship God. To Penn's New Zion begin to come tens of thousands of German Protestants who bring their own language, their own culture, their own printing presses and newspapers. The colonies are taking on a greater and greater variety. King Charles gives Carolina to a group of eight court favorites. By the terms of the charter, these eight men are given title to roughly all the land between Florida and Virginia, westward to the Pacific, a territory larger than most European countries. But the English will be unable to work their huge plantations themselves. More and more, they will turn to importing Negro slaves. And as the plantation system begins to spread in the South, as the profits from the slave trade grow, the institution of Negro slavery becomes more and more important to the Southern economy. By 1760, there are almost 300,000 Negroes in the colony. Some are free. Most are slaves. They number less than 10% of the population of New England and the Middle Colonies. In the South, they range from 15% of the population of North Carolina to 70% of the population of South Carolina. The last colony to be charted is also in the South. James Oglethorpe founds Georgia, giving refuge to men from debtors' prison. In little more than a century, the new world was settled from Massachusetts to Georgia. In 1607, Jamestown had been settled. In 1620, Plymouth. In 1630, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. By 1641, there were 50,000 settlers in the colony. Seventy-five years later, the population was 435,000. By the time of the revolution, the 13 colonies numbered two and one-half million people, a third as many as the mother country. Most were English, but there were also Swedes and Dutch. Germans by the tens of thousands. French Huguenots, Scotch-Irish, Jews, and hundreds of thousands of Negro slaves and free Negroes. An incredible variety of people who would have to learn to live together and accept each other's differences. The beginnings had been incredibly hard. made life a little easier for the next. But it was never easy. Each man and woman who came had to say goodbye, frequently forever, to country, to family, to friends. The long sea voyage was always a danger. And in the New World, there was constant threat from the Indians, who more and more resisted the invasion of their land. But from the beginning, for most people, at least most Europeans, America was the promise of a better life. As long as men believed that promise, nothing could stop them.